3,000 kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean. So, hi, Zach. How are you doing today? Hey, Roman. Yeah, I'm good today. It's, Very nice, it's morning to here. On board. Very nice to meet yeah. you. <laughs> morning here and afternoon for you. <laughs> International good. podcast. Loving this. So, this is the first podcast. And today we are with uh, Isaac Kenyon from UK. Is that right? Yeah, that's me. Yeah, just, uh, uh, just from north of London. North of London. How is the weather there? Uh, I'm looking out the window. It's well. It's obviously early in the morning where it is. It's about seven seven a.m. Bit cloudy today. Um, <laughs> well, that would stop me getting out there. <laughs> cold. Uh, yeah, probably cold compared to where you are. <laughs> yeah, we are in Malaysia, so it's thirty five degrees every day. <laughs> oh wow, that 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 to us is uh, hotter than our summer. <laughs> So we've got a few questions for you on this podcast today. And the first one is, how did you get into endurance sport adventure? And what do you do when you are not adventuring? So outdoor sports and adventure sports, that came to me, I guess, out of a desperation to get more outdoors. Um, so when I was quite young, um, I was very much always swimming. So I spent a lot of my time in a pool. I had lots of energy and my parents actually just threw me into a swimming pool and said, right, get rid of your energy. So 20, 20 to 30 hours a week, I was in a swimming pool for most of my life up until the age of 18. Then I went to university and things wow. changed. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was, well, basically I spent most of my time indoors. I was indoors at home playing playstations and things like this. And then I was in indoor swimming pool and basically everything was indoors focused. And when I got to university, I studied geology, the natural environment. And, um, that started to inspire me to get outdoors a bit more. I had a bit of mental health issues. And when I was doing nature stuff, like walks and walks through woodlands and things like that, it was really helping me. So I started doing outdoor um, sort of things like hiking or swimming, wild swimming. And then I was thinking, I need an ex I need a reason, like a, a bigger reason to spend more time outdoors. So I set, started setting myself challenges that were outdoors. So big, big challenges. And I like the idea of endurance because it has so many factors to it. So many levels, so many levels of where you've got the mental aspects of it and how can i keep going for this long you have? pardon what kind of health issue do you have mental health issue um quite high levels of anxiety so panic disorder um a lot of it was is to do with overwhelming stimulus um technology and people and too too many things at once can overwhelm you and i was i was very much just doing too much and I was on social media all the time. I was on computers all the time. And I ended up thinking like, I can't do all this stuff. I can't keep up. I'm not a robot. I'm... And then I started having a panic disorder because I felt like I was letting everybody down. And I was, because when you have social media, <laughs> you can say, you can say yes to 1 million people in a second. <laughs> exactly. And you can say, you can commit to millions of things so fast. In real life, you can't really commit like that. Yeah. On, online you can you can talk to these people and say yeah i'll do that yeah i'll do that and then it, and then you realize there's actually a lot more to the yes than just saying yes <laughs> and then you realize oh my god i'm gonna let everybody down and then that's this is where it all stems from really endurance was like how can i um spend more time in the outdoors for longer periods so endurance and how can i also push myself physically and mentally to reach my limits um i was very experimental uh, at that time because i was i spent a lot of time in a swimming pool so my next challenge was swimming the english channel uh so that was swimming from england to france over the sea across this really busy dangerous shipping lane and through like jellyfish and cold water <laughs> and weren't allowed to wear a wetsuit so it was very cold so there was a lot of mental challenge in dealing with the cold it was about 10 degrees so that was quite hard to when when was that which year did you do that I did that in 2015, 2015. 2015. So that was my first endurance outdoor challenge. 
and it got me into outdoor swimming in lakes outdoor swimming in the sea and experiencing time outside um to a fuller extent so that's that's how it all began yeah. how do you go from your normal day life to going in the sea on the sea or in the mountains yeah so that that leap that that jump i think was a matter of balance finding that balance between how much time that i could live in this normal world where well it's not very normal anymore we are fast paced with technology yeah and it is moving so fast that the 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 new the new tech the new things to keep up with um if you if you if you don't understand how to use a smartphone you're going to be left behind exactly. if you don't know how to use a computer you're you're left you're left behind in society and economy economy requires it and if economy requires it most employment requires it which means your financial income is tied to your ability to understand technology It's which is really dangerous some people can't pick it up that fast especially older people yeah our so, generation because our generation i think you're around the same age as me and if we don't keep up then we <laughs> we lost yeah you, essentially it is it's 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 incredible so that's normal life and then adventuring well doing outdoors activities and having fun outdoors in this way it doesn't require this keeping up of no. you actually slow down things slow down things become human relaxing you're not you're not lost in translation trying to figure out life all the time because you can't keep up with the speed of it yeah. um, it's really nice so i use it as a balance this go you know you'll find me up a mountain or you find me swimming in the sea diving in the sea cycling over sea rowing across an ocean like <laughs> doing these incredible things outside because these things like paddleboarding whatever it is helps me keep focus and brings me back to nature which is where i'm from and i'm not i'm not from the digital airwaves <laughs> so so it, it in my day-to-day -day life this this provides me balance mentally and physically you know you can't get that balance from technology if you overwhelm yourself on tech in the normal day-to-day -day, you do need to have your outlets otherwise it will catch you one way or another And you'll find that your mental health will start slipping. Your physical health will start slipping. You'll go to the doctors and the doctors will prescribe you nature and outdoors probably. And get out and read off of the phone. <laughs> yeah. Or traveling yeah. without a phone. Yeah, see if you can travel without a phone. I we mean, lots of people rely on it for navigation. We did it before. We did it with yeah. maps. Before uh, we had a map and books. <laughs> Yeah, or we used our voice and chat to people to tell us where to go, right? Exactly. I don't know if you've been backpacking back in the days. I mean, like 10 or 15 years ago. Have you yeah, been maps. backpacking? Yeah, maps. Yeah, maps. Books, talk to people, getting lost, experience. I mean, this makes the journey and the the memory really cool because you you have a, a you know some people Sorry, around you that you remember. Yeah, and you yeah, it's it's kind of more exploration. I find when you have like where you are exactly where you are on a map on your phone, you never feel lost. No, there's something about the Google Maps. You could be in the middle of a jungle, and then <laughs> you have your little dot on the map, and you know where you are. And you you, it, you could be in the Amazon. It it doesn't feel as lost. exploration or adventurous or lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah I totally so, agree with this. I miss I miss the backpacking and the whole days, just having the landed planet in my in my bag and. I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Uh, I'd like to touch uh, your most recent pedal for pack eco adventure about climate solution. What do you think about the importance of telling these untold climate solution stories? The importance for me is everything. So th this whole project, pedal for parts, my most recent, has turned into a probably something I'm just going to keep doing because. One of the things that I noticed was, yes, nature is really important for our physical mental health, which is why I started doing outdoor adventures and endurance to balance my life, my normal technology life um, with outdoors, which gives me that human con nature connection. But the thing that I've started to realize more and more is how much we take from nature and how much we interfere with it as humans. And 
one of the things that we are really doing is we are changing you know the climate with our buildings resource taking electricity making from fossil fuels whatever it is we are as humans we are I- impacting the environment and there is no mistake there's no i think we've gone past the days of denial of this now this is a real thing and one of the things that climb like the climate solutions story in this pedal for parks expedition was about was it feels like sometimes there's no hope for younger generation you hear in the news oh my god in x amount of years this is going to happen there's wildfires all the bloody time sorry people don't care. i should have said that yeah there was uh pe- yeah it people are kind of like um numb to it it's one there's been so much of it that people don't care anymore because they're just kind of numb to it you know when you shout when you try to sell something to someone so many times they'll never buy it just yeah. because you try you oversell it's a bit like this uh we we've over climate changed everything and one of the things that we wanted to do <clears throat> and my vision was highlighting a positive outcome or things that people can do to make a change rather than talking about the problem so we, I think we're done talking about the issues. I mean, we're seeing these issues, tsunamis. We see, we see this all the time, right? Yeah. Yes, great. We know what the issue is. Now let's focus on how we can fix it. And that's what Paddle for Parks was trying to do. Use an adventure. So we did a cycle across the UK to different environmental projects, people who are making big changes in the, in the way we live, what we do with our resources, and how we can be more environmentally friendly and coexist with nature. Things like right now in our situation, we are as humans versus nature, right? It feels like a competition, you know, and who's going to win at the start? Yeah, we will win, but in the end, we will lose. We need to learn to coexist. How can nature and us exist at the same time? Can we build towns and cities that allow nature to run through them? We can. But do we can, it's possible. Want. Do the government well, want to do it? That's the thing. Well, this is it. Money, right? And money. it it doesn't breed economy doing yeah. these environmental things. It costs money. But in the long run, in the long run, it will not, it will actually be a financial investment for the better. Because what will happen is we'll get to a point where we invest so much on urbanization, for instance, and resources and things like this, that we'll get to a point where, oh dear everyone's mental health is shot everyone is in terrible state of array we need to fix this let's put green space oh how do we inject green space oh i'm not sure we're gonna have to take down buildings and da, da, da. so if you build to a company this company this if you build with the long-term thinking that we're going to incorporate nature that would be good so this is what we did pedal parks was all about a film documentary and highlighting climate solutions that people can see get involved in, raise awareness of, maybe even invest in to uh, make them scale up. Uh, and and it gives people hope, you know, young yeah. people. You, you, they're, think they're, they're that so is, yeah. you think that maybe something is missing with that children education. Maybe they should teach children at school. They should teach them how to protect the environment and do something with it. I think so. I think, it, yeah, a respect. Take them into... Uh, into these in environments uh, like forest schools for instance to to learn about nature and how you can live live with it and why it's important for you i think when you for instance take kids into uh, an outdoor sport when they're young they love the sport it's really fun like bmx biking or whatever and then you know or mountain biking through the woods they love it yeah and when they love it they want to take care of the environment because they know that if that environment isn't there, then their bike park where they where they do their biking won't happen. So I think it's important that we educate through maybe um, exposing young children to nature so they understand and appreciate it. In cities, that doesn't happen. And in poorer places, like it doesn't happen at all. My my school was a very poor place um, in Luton. It was a poor school. We didn't have much um, focus on nature at all or the environment. It was all about just getting people's maths grades up or making sure that everyone is passing their science tests. These things are important. I understand that. But also it's important to understand the the wider concept of the world, bigger picture than just a textbook. 
I think we need to start thinking like this, especially with the children. Yeah. National curriculums need to change and have more environmental teaching and learning and education. Broadens, you know, it, 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 for kids, it gives it gives confidence, it empowers them, it improves their well being. There's so many benefits to incorporating outdoor education. I heard recently that in uh, in Finland, in Finland is they from seven years old, I think, they bring the kids to the forest and taking class in the forest. Yeah, well, really? they do this in England and the UK. We do do this as well. They do it as well. Only in places where the schools are near the forests. All right. So if you're in the, if you're in the city, Mark it costs money. You have to get all <laughs> the kids out. We need to get them all on the bus and we need to go to this place, right? That yeah. costs money, so they don't do it. So cities, no, but yeah it's brilliant what finland are able to roll that roll that out norway does it as well all yeah, across norway. the country all, all the north turned country norway sweden they are very like aware about the environment about what's going on and teaching kids from the beginning from the beginning yeah. to open their mind and eyes and yeah yeah we need to do this everywhere around the world that would be awesome i think we li i live in malaysia and uh, i don't know if you, you've been to malaysia i can't remember I've not. I was going to go during yeah. the pandemic started. I yeah. was going to go eight, April 2020 and then the plane stopped. The I was going to be climbing stopped. Mount Kinabalu. I was going to go to Bur Burma. Oh, uh, Burma in Mount Kinabalu. I'm planning Mount Kinabalu yeah. this year as well, but I don't know if I will. Have. Are you? <laughs> I, I'll be going, I think I'll be going as soon as it clears up a bit, maybe next year, uh, oh. where I think hopefully I'm crossing fingers, COVID will be better by then. Oh, we hope so too. But the environment in Malaysia is a big issue as well. People have no clue about the environment and they're throwing papers by the window, plastic and everything is a... That's a very, very big issue in Malaysia. I went rafting um, two weeks ago and the boat stopped for two minutes. Everyone smoking their cigarette. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And they throw the cigarettes in the river. I'm like, guys, <laughs> why? Uh, it's why? incentives as well. It's incentives. If, if you are uh, fined on the spot for throwing rubbish. Yeah. If they just find you, police was like, okay, 100 quid now. Or... If it was fine on the spot, I think this will change people's mind as well as recycling. If you know, in places like um, Sweden or I think it's Sweden, yes, yeah, Sweden, you can take your um, plastic bottles, for instance, and take them into a, a supermarket. There is a recycling center there where you put your 20, uh, you put your bottle in there, you get 20 P. Yeah, you get money. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like this would Germany be really well. good. They do it yeah, in Germany too. Germany as well. Very good. Very good um you can make uh, a lot of money actually just yeah. by cleaning other people's mess exactly exactly <laughs> we hope for change <laughs> yeah yeah um where else have you bike back before so you said you bike so, in, in england before have you bike back anywhere else um not really abroad properly i've bike packed for, we bike packed scotland england um, but I also did Wales. I did a bikepacking trip from north to south of Wales. Um, and that that probably was one of the toughest bikepacking trips I did because it was my first one. And where, it was where, the one where, <laughs> yeah, the one where you realize you've got too much kit and <laughs> the, the, hill, the hills are really steep and you realize your bike is not ready. And it's, you know, your first one where you're kind of like just getting your toes into it and you think, wow, this is. This is such an incredible way of life, but incredibly tough as well, if you don't know what you're doing. Exactly. So I, I, rem I, I remember we started just north of Snowdonia mountain range. So you start, it's quite flat, and then suddenly you go into the toughest, steepest hills, like 25% uh, gradients, <laughs> uh, stuff like this. And it just gets really tough uh, in, in the mountains. And uh, what I loved about that trip was when you just get get somewhere like a, a bit of greenery at the end of the day go under a tree <laughs> just take your tent out from your bike take your food out from your bike take your water out make some make it so self-sufficient you literally could live you could live on this bike it's like a it's like a camper van but tiny tiny yeah. one <laughs> it's amazing and uh it was such an incredible experience and yeah so that was my 
other bikepacking experience before doing across the UK? Where, where else would you like to, to bikepack? Where, where would be your, your next bike, bike, bikepacking trip? Oh, wow. I have lots of ideas. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to do some Scandinavia. Bikepacking in Scandinavia. This yeah. looks wild, like quite wild. And another place I would like to bikepack as well is uh, somewhere like um, like China or like somewhere a bit kind of remote. really remote yeah near near the mountains somewhere like that would be quite cool you should sure maybe mongolia. Was, yeah mongolia i bet that's that that would be a brilliant place to go yeah i watched a film recently um they do horse taming there don't they yeah they do uh, they're wild horses they can just jump on the back of one of them and then <laughs> like claim it as their own it it's is incredible <laughs> i don't um, know if you or, heard about team cop have you heard about team cop there's an no, Australian one? dude, and he uh, started in Mongolia with his horse all the way to Hungary. So he, wow. just, he just did, I don't know how many kilometers, I can't remember, but he followed the uh, Kangis Khan, you know, Kangis Khan? Yeah. And he followed his, his step on the, on the Silk Road with his horse and his dog. Wow. So it's amazing. That's a cool, yeah. that's a cool, cool, <laughs> cool idea. And a fun I have trip. no idea how he did it with his horse at the border to cross borders. But that's <laughs> not <the DNA. laughs> Yeah, uh, horses have passports. So they have passports. You have a horse passport. So maybe uh, he was able to get, it, to get it stabbed. Yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> you do. Yeah, so maybe the horse, uh, he, he had a very good passport then. <laughs> <laughs> More stamp than me, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I've heard this year you're looking to break a new record as well, indoor rowing. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so during the pandemic, it was really hard for a lot of people, right? So yeah. people struggle mentally. Now think about the people who are already struggling mentally, the autistic people. People with autism, this uh, pandemic was hard enough. Like they're already struggling anyway. Uh, I have a family member with him. And basically, I wanted to do something with a friend of mine for autism. And my friend's cousin, he has uh, autism and they both struggled, my, my, my family member and his family member. So we thought we'll do something that is quite good for autism. So there's National World Autism Awareness Week, which is in the beginning of, of and end of May. so end of March, the last week of March to beginning of April is World Autism Awareness Week. And we're going to do a indoor row. So rowing on a machine for as many days as we possibly can in this week, nonstop, wow. continually and try and break a record as a tandem. So previously, I broke the record for the longest continual row. So by myself, I broke the record by yourself. By yourself. I've done this before. Yeah. 83 hours. 83 hours yeah rowing so you sleep while rowing <laughs> no, no sleeping no, no sleeping at <laughs> uh, this time i'm going to do it with a friend and see how many we can do and we're raising money for the uh the, the charities and that support you know autism so this is what this is what i'm trying to do it's going to be a bit of a mental challenge for my friend and i, I think he he's very keen to do it because he knows i've already broken the record before so i have some tips and tricks to stay away uh and things like this so Is I don't no, take break, no break during 83 hours no break uh, i didn't have a yeah not really well about eating i was only a, I was, I was a, yeah you have to eat when you're rowing when i went to the toilet i um was allowed every hour five minutes to like leave to go to the toilet and back do you know how many kilometers or miles have you done during those 80 83 hours? hours? Yeah, quite a long, long way. About, well, I think it was about 350, 400 kilometers of rowing. Wow. <laughs> you must have been so exhausted was, after, no? Yeah, well, I slept like a baby. Huh? <laughs> I, I, I would say, actually, do you know what? I was silly. I went to work the next day. Oh, yeah, my God. <laughs> and I got to work and I kid you not I was like my eyes were just glued because obviously I slept from the end of the challenge to the start and the alarm went off obviously and my eyes were just stuck together at work 
<laughs> and people were taught people were taught to me and i felt like i don't know if you feel like you're in a dream i felt like i was a bit of in a dream and uh, they were saying hey isaac or that's literally what i heard i just heard in my head no you didn't know what what you you did or not they knew what was yeah uh, they did. They, some of them did, and um, they, some of them were like, "Wow, like well done," this, this sort of thing. But um, what I did have uh, one person come up to me is like, "You shouldn't have come to work. You're useless today." <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember I was like, "Well, actually, I have managed to do some stuff today, so it was worth it." <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a mistake. So next time, uh, this world record we're doing, we have taken day off work afterwards. Better. And when is it going to be? Which days? Uh, so, so we're going to start on the first of April, twenty twenty-two. All right. And we and we'll see how far we can go. So this time is well, going to be the two of you. Yeah, yeah. So we switch like rotation. Yeah. So it should be easier this time. Well. Yeah. Well, what is your goal for for this um, challenge? So the world record stands at thirty-six hours. So we'll try and do longer than that. But let's see, let's see what we can do. Huh? Any goals in mind? Uh, yeah. maybe? One is one is one is thirty six hours one minute. <laughs> <laughs> but we try we try and uh, do I think two days. Two days. Forty eight right. hours because I I'm you know my friend has not done this before. He's not endurance athlete. He's just really never done this stuff before. So it's it's really I don't want to kill him. <laughs> if that makes sense so we we're going we're going at a steady, steady pace together <laughs> all right we go at, we go at his pace see how he gets on <laughs> can you tell us about your rowing experience that you just did your longest rowing experience in the sea yeah yeah so um i rowed across the atlantic ocean so earlier i just said i broke the world record 83 hours this was Oh, training no. prep no. <laughs> this was training training preparation for rowing across the atlantic ocean i rowed in a, in a team of four we had a ocean rowing boat which has cabins it has space and compartments to take all your food it has um, a water maker so a desalination machine which sucks up seawater and then desalinates it gets rid of the salt so that you can drink fresh water it had solar panels for electricity had navigation equipment so that you could navigate your way and obviously ocean ro and oars and oars like rowing oars so you can paddle your way across and we rowed from the um canary islands which are just off the west coast of africa so we started on an island called lagomera in a town called san sebastian and this was um which was the harbor area the start of this row and then we finished in the caribbean in Antigua and Barbuda, so Antigua, the Caribbean island of Antigua, and we finished wow. in the um, historical English harbour, which was uh, one of the maritime ports that the uh, English um, people had acquired uh, during their um, exploration of the world, I say. How many days? And, uh, that was 40 days. 40 days. So we rode, we rode for 40 days. Do you know what? This was really funny, right? So before the expedition, it took three years to prepare. We had to raise £120,000 money so that we could buy the boat, get all the food, get all of the um, permits and insurances and all this stuff. So during this time, these three years, I tell, tell everyone the answer. They say, how long will it take you to do this? I said, 40 days. And when we did it, we did it dead on 40 days. I was like, wow. <laughs> I should have bet on this millions of pounds. I would have made <laughs> lots of money. <laughs> uh, so that was a good guess. Um, yeah, so we rode uh, two hours and two hours off. So we had two people who'd row at the same time. And then two people who would either be cooking, sleeping, resting, that sort of thing. Navigation, boat maintenance, making water, cleaning the solar panels, checking the electricity. That, that, that was what you do when you're not rowing. And we do this 24-7 for 40 days there was no breaks we did this in the winter we did it over christmas and new year's uh, so the only the only uh, christmas present i had was 15 minutes phone call with my family on the satellite phone 
saying Merry sure Christmas. My Christmas. <laughs> yeah, my my Christmas is different to your one this year. <laughs> hope, hope the turkey is good. My dehydrated <laughs> ration pack was delicious today. <laughs> How do you make sure that the board goes straight? You have um, a, a sort of a rudder at the bottom, and that rudder is um, controlled with a machine called an auto helm. So the solar panels powers all of the electric electronics, right? And this thing called an auto helm or an auto tiller, it's a, it's a device that they use in sailing. And what you do is you put the bearing that you want through the map and the navigation. And then what it does, it fights the rudder and keeps the rudder in line in the same position. Wow. The problem with ocean, ocean rowing is it's not very fast. So when you're rowing, the rudder is under lots of pressure because um, the speed is too slow. So the water and the currents can put more pressure on the rudder so you need a strong machine to try and fight that and keep it in the right position so that's how we did the navigation how fast can you go maybe uh depends right so Tuna. on an ocean on an ocean it's different so when we were in when we were on flat in the uk we were training on flat in the uk we managed to go five knots which is about i don't know six kilometers per hour seven mm -hmm. kilometers per hour uh, six kilometers per hour seven kilometers per hour on the ocean you go up these waves like a roller coaster you are rowing up the wave and it's like 20 feet high <laughs> massive wave yeah you get to the top starts foaming you know like surfing yeah and yeah. your boat surfs the wave the wave propels your boat so fast you can go up to like 30 kilometers per hour wow <laughs> so yeah, uh, you just you. Uh, it's not that fast, but on the sea, this is quite quite quick for uh, zero effort. Yeah, just go on the top of the wave, and the wave takes you. What was the that biggest was cool. challenge while rowing across the ocean? People, people. The yeah, I mean, we imagine right four, four of you in this tight space. That the boat is only you know ten foot long, so roughly. 20, sorry, it's 29 foot long, I think the boat is. It's, it's, it's quite, it's not a very long boat. There's not a lot of space. No, it's not. I mean, there is no space. You, you are one meter from somebody at all times, <laughs> right? Social distance. All, right? Social distancing, <laughs> non no, 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 non-existent on that thing. <laughs> so when you have arguments, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal. No escape. Like, yeah, it's a big deal. You have an argument. It's a big deal. Like, if uh, people are not doing do rowing or it, rowing properly, they're sleeping on shift because they're tired. And the other person's rowing. That person's going to get annoyed. But you're sleeping on shift. Why don't you sleep in your break? Some people uh, would eat sneakily while the other one's not looking. It's like you should be eating when you're on your break, not when you're right. So there was lots of arguments like this and they become a big deal. So, yeah, people was hard. Yeah. What about the sharks or whales? Or... Oh, wow, the whales, yeah. <laughs> Amazing, the whales. We didn't see a shark, but the whales, we saw lots of, and we swam with them. I swam with the whale. I jumped in the water, and I was in the middle of the Atlantic floating, and a whale was swimming around me. Quite a few, actually, on the one, the time, one occasion. Like double-decker bus, like massive, huge 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 things like big as a house they're huge their eye was like as big of in my head <laughs> it was massive and i remember being like i'm in somebody's garden i shouldn't be here <laughs> I, need, I need to i need to get away from here uh this, this, this he was looking at me this uh, it could have been a she i don't know but this whale was just circling and it was just looking at me saying what are you what doing? Are you? <laughs> what what are you? Some alien? What are you? Like, I've never seen you before. <laughs> uh, so so yeah. So it was pretty amazing experience like this, like swimming with the dolphins as well. You had a lot of dolphins that would migrate across the sea, across the Atlantic as well. Any adventure plans that you can tell us about? Something that you plan in a in a very next future, very very soon near future plans yeah i have a few right quite 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 a few always got a few so I've, I've in terms of adventure so not records or endurance this is adventure 
I have the ambition to do a big sustainable journey again, like I did last time with Pedal of Parks, but do it uh, uh, under a different brand, Climate Explorers. And I want to be able to pass through multiple countries doing the same thing where we cycled maybe on electric electric uh, bikes to test like it as a climate solution uh, or hydrogen powered bike. And we will try and highlight as many climate solutions as we can through Europe. So not just UK only, let's go through Europe and see what different countries are doing and then make a film out of this. So that's way, one, Spain, one. Portugal, maybe? Or to Spain or Portugal or maybe to... Uh, well, we were thinking of uh, UK to somewhere like Egypt or something. All right. Go like really, yeah. really far. Uh, but we will see because obviously geopolitically, it's quite tricky in those areas. You know, yeah. Syria, Israel, it's uh, not the most uh, friendly at the moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. And, um, another adventure is big swimming. So I am looking to do some of the biggest swims in the world. So the hardest swims, notorious ones in the world, um, ones that are like the English channel swim, but do it solo. But I'm, I'm looking to do one that's not been done before. Um, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to swim from one country to another country that's not been done before. So yeah, watch this space. I'm not going to reveal too much because it's, uh, <laughs> there's sponsorship and uh, media rights to this, but yeah. I will I will say that it, I have a big swim uh, coming up in the next few we're years. We're thinking and about the, the seven swims as well, yeah? Seven swims. Seven. I was, I was, yeah, seven swims is uh, is one, one of the challenges. One of them, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. maybe for the next so podcast we can talk yeah. about there. Yeah, we could talk we'll talk about swimming in shark infested waters, uh, <laughs> through jellyfish in different countries around the world. That sounds good. <laughs> what about swimming the Amazon? The Amazon has been swum before. Uh, it has be, been swum uh, before. Yeah. Um, this, uh, what this is will this? be an interest. Um, I forgot his name. Um, what was this? I can't remember either. But the African whoever, guy. That, the African guy. Uh, unbelievable i can't remember his name now can't remember his name uh, it's a bit worrying isn't it swimming in the amazon like the snakes the crocodile like the things that are in that river nice. and uh how did it, how they got that how that that person didn't get eaten um, parasites or unbelievable uh, and he did maybe he did like him. 10 meters 10 <laughs> meters jump in the boat 10 meters jump in the boat my god this guy this guy is crazy he he's crossed the uh, antarctic as well the arctic ah, god i can't remember his name now <laughs> yeah he'll, he'll come to us he'll come, come to, to us, us later. So, if, if you uh listen to his podcast please uh message us his name yeah and let <laughs> us know. i know he's from south africa but i can't remember his name i know he's gonna come back to me after but i can't remember <laughs> can't remember yeah <laughs> Okay, just let us know what adventure means to you. What is the adventure, of adventure for you? Ah, his name was Martin Strell. Ah, that's Martin not the one Strell. I'm thinking about. That's not the one I'm thinking about. Um, oh, okay, different one. Me... But yeah, so uh, I would say the adventure, how it means to me. Yeah. I think adventure, adventure is everything. Um, adventure is learning something new, challenging yourself getting either outdoors or even challenging yourself indoors, exploring a new thing you've not done before. This is adventure. And for me, it can be a, a different route on the way to work, walking somewhere on the way to work, a mini adventure, 15 minutes long adventure, or it could be rowing across the Atlantic Ocean, 40 days extreme outdoors, nature, sea, rowing adventure. Uh, for me, it can be any, any scale. It's just doing something new that challenges you and you learn something from it. You, what, what have you learned from all those trips and those adventure? What have you learned? What is the main thing? I've the main thing I've learned is that it's never too late to try. Never too late. You to can try. do it. Yeah, you can do it whenever. Like I learned to row when I was age 22 years old. I'd never rowed before. I'd never sailed before. And in two years, I was able to row across the Atlantic Ocean. That's amazing. You can do these things. I never cycled before. Cycling was very 
I never done the bike packing before. And then I cycled across Wales and then six months later I cycled the UK. Yeah. I mean, you, you can do these things if you put your mind to it. And I know obviously if you're disabled, there's going to be different challenges, but there are ways of working around. For instance, you could get um, electric motor to do your, your, your route if you had a problem or, I know some people who are disabled who might not be able to do it, but what I'm saying is for the majority of people, I think with these challenges, it's possible. And um, it's never I, too late to try. I saw some people by packing with one leg. Like, yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. I, there was people who rode across the Atlantic Ocean in like a state of paralysis where they could only use their oars, but they couldn't actually move their body. So it's yeah. just their arms. They couldn't use their back or their legs, but they still were able to do it. Or even rode with one one leg. <laughs> there, it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's very possible the outdoor challenges. But I think you don't even have to to do an adventure and some. Like, it doesn't have to be something like rowing the ocean. You can, you know, as I say, take a new route to work. Go go through the forest instead of going through the through the concrete jungle. Yeah. And what would be your advice to people who want to start their adventure? What would be your, your first advice for them? Start small and work your way up. So have a big vision, like something you like, say, for instance, you see, I don't know if people are watching this. Um, they will see that I have a mountain in the background <laughs> of my screen during this podcast. You want to get to the top of this mountain. But first, you must learn many things before you can get to the top of the mountain. And you need to take these as steps, right? So you break it down. You have this big goal in mind at the top. And then you break it down in small little pieces. And you start small and you build your way up. So first, I need to have the fitness to do this mountain climb. So let's start getting fit. I need to learn to do uh, mountaineering. So I need to learn, do some courses maybe on uh, outdoor hiking and getting up, uh, maybe ice climbing or rock climbing and stuff like this. You you break it down into manageable chunks and you'll get to your goal so whenever you're doing these big adventures big big adventures like what i've done in the past you need to break it down into tiny little pieces and start yeah. small and then get bigger yeah i yeah, mean yeah. when i did my bike packing right to learn to cycle first i learned uh cycling around in in outside my house like a little kid <laughs> and i was like 20 24 years old right just cycling around like a kid trying to figure out how to do the clip on, clip out, these things. And then uh, I cycled from my house to town, which was 15 minutes. And then I, you know, you go from there and then you, you can go further and further and do bigger and bigger. But it, it doesn't come straight away. No, it won't. Yeah, it won't. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, where are our listeners going to be able to, to hear this podcast? So, uh, well... I guess you'll have it distributed on your channels, your YouTube. Course, but yeah. I, I like I, I will share as well. So um you can find find me um at isaacenyon.com. So I S W A C K E N Y O N dot com. So that's my website. Um the podcast will be on the website. Uh, I also have social media as well. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all of these things. And I will also add Isaac's details in the description below, including all his social media. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and feel free to get in touch if you have adventures in mind that you are looking to do, want advice or have ideas um, or just want to chat about things like mental health, environment. I'm open to that. So, yeah, feel free to get in touch. So Isaac talked earlier about like it's never too late as well to, to start a trip. And on our next podcast, we're going to have a person called Robert. And Robert is 80 years old and he's going to start cycling from Alaska to Costa Rica. So it's a 13,500 uh, kilometers bike tour at 80 years old. <laughs> so, so there is no limit. This is like Isaac said, there is no age to start and no excuses. 80 years old, 13,500 kilometers is going to be on our next podcast so if you do not want to miss it guys <laughs> click on the notification bell and you will be able to hear about uh, robert as well on the next podcast brilliant <laughs> i look forward to listening to robert and hearing hearing his story and what he's going to do 
Yeah, it was very, very nice to meet you, uh, Isaac. I wish you all the best. Thanks, Roman. I'm looking forward to uh, staying in touch. I'm looking forward to uh, how this podcast goes. No problem. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye. Bye.